Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three issues of Echoes from Fomalout by Gabor Lux. This is the EMDT, First Hungarian D20 Society. This is the producer um, of Castles in Tillin. And I had had these zines for some time. I've had, I have the whole set of the Fomalout series and I just hadn't honestly taken a close look at them. I, I, I glanced over them a couple times. I really like Castles and Tillin, but what I, I have to admit, when I first read these zines, I kind of bounced off them. I kind of thought, well, they're kind of weird, and there's a lot of weird stuff in them, and I don't know if I'll ever use them, really. I thought they were cool, and there was a lot of interesting ideas, but I hadn't read them all that closely. And then I had Castles and Tillin, and just, you know, it's my absolute favorite Mega Dungeon, one of my favorite adventures that I have. It, it's super fun. I've run it a bunch of times, and every time it's been really, 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 really successful. And so I decided to give these a, you know, a second look, and I'm really glad that I did. Now, I don't think my first impression that they're weird has changed. They are very weird, as you guys will see. But I'm going to be going through issue number one, Beware the Beekeeper, issue number two, Gaunt, Nest of Spies, and issue number three, Blood, Death, and Tourism. And at some point, I might go through the, the rest. But for now, I just want to go through these three zines. They are not just simply uh, an adventure or a setting or anything like that. They're, they've got a lot of stuff in each of them. Some of them have multiple adventures, different sets of rules. Uh, there's just you know bits of world building. Uh, a setting is kind of developed over the course of some of these uh, zines. And so I'll talk about them as we go through. Uh, now, there's a lot of great... Um, I don't know, there's just like good introductions to each of these. They're kind of interesting, funny. And, and there's a lot of very useful tools in these books. Bazaar of the Bazaar. A great table for nature. Persona is selling wares with complications. That's great. And you just roll four times and you have a random guy selling something, a random person selling something in a market. Right? You might get a, a backstabbing bureaucrat is selling incense and the complication is that it's from the underworld. Or maybe it's a duplicitous haggler who is selling heresies, uh, but it's not even his stand, <laughs> right? Really weird stuff that you can roll up here. Uh, D100 table four times. That's great. Stuff like this, I love. I'm happy to add it into any game. S small table of caravan goods, and then rules of the game, what you can kind of expect in this scene, what's what it expects. The first and I think main feature of this first scene is the Singing Caverns, which is Beware the Beekeeper. It's an adventure module for level for levels two through four. Now, one of the things that you're going to find about anything done in these zines is that nothing is boring. Nothing's boring. Every adventure is jam-packed with stuff. And it's interactable stuff, it's whimsical stuff, it's wild stuff sometimes. It's always amusing, it's always entertaining, it's always engaging. The downside of this is that it requires a very specific kind of campaign. It requires a very specific tone, which is kind of tongue-in-cheek, very, not meta exactly, but like, hey, we're playing a game. We know that we're playing a game. You have to be okay having a, a crazy combination. You'll see in a minute. A crazy combination of like a random tavern in the middle of a cavern system where there are bandits who are kind of like, you know, a uh, Robin Hood sort of nearby. There's a beekeeper druid who summons bees. There are traps in this random cave system. There are statues that have been enchanted. Like, it's just all of this stuff packed together in a small cave system without, I mean, there's a small bit of explanation of why this is here, but it's not a cohesive explanation, a realistic system or anything like that. You really have to be aware of that going in. So as we go through, that's one of the things you're going to have to, like, you know, if you want to use this, you're going to have to be okay with that. It's in a very specific tone of campaign. It's one of the reasons why I initially bounced off of it. When I first got these, I was much more interested in a, I guess you might say, a cohesive world, a, a world that made sense. Um, I was trying to bring stuff into my game. I had a much more serious tone in my games. And I think since I've started to shift away from 5e into the OSR, I'm more comfortable with, with the ridiculous. I'm more comfortable with the gamey side of things. And so maybe that's part of the reason why I'm, I've been much more comfortable with these adventures, much more um, interested in them, uh, these, these zines, since I've looked at them again. But leaving all that aside, 
If you just want to take individual encounters or rooms from these zines, you absolutely can because again, they're not terribly too closely connected and they're all pretty interesting. Like the beekeeper is a really interesting creature, villain thing. And you could put that in your world as like a weird, horrible kind of, you know, thing you have to get by or your players have to interact with or kill or negotiate with or, you know, whatever. You could put that in your world. Now, one thing that I have to say about these dungeons is that it's not terribly easy to just jump back and forth between what's going on and the map because the map is on a very specific page. It's not spread out throughout the throughout the zine. That's, you know, whatever, that's, that's fine. But because there isn't this sort of really cohesive, I don't know how to put it, not narrative, but like the, the rooms often do feel like just one thing next to another. It can kind of feel hard to follow the movement through the dungeon. And so like, I don't know, I just, I get lost as I'm reading through it sometimes. Or I guess the first couple times I read through it, I got a little lost. But it's not the end of the world and you can certainly trace it out as you go. And again, what's going on here is really, really fun. There's a lot of interesting encounters. And one of the things that these zines make clear is that your players are going to make choices. It's not, oh, well, here's the map of the first level and you can see it's kind of a confusing map at first. Um, the one, two, three, four, five isn't immediately connected to the rest of the dungeon. You have to come in through a different entrance to get to the rest of the dungeon or different entrances. So that's something to consider. Now, the, the, the adventure doesn't exactly present, um, it doesn't really present a, a bunch of, uh, how do you put it? There's no reason to be here. There's no reason to be here. It's just a bunch of random doors, random entrances, random things happening. And it's up to you and maybe your players to figure out why you should be here. And what that means is that the different entrances can be entered and approached based on the different entrances and, and, and what's in them. So you don't have to start at one, in other words. You could start in 17, you could start in, in 20, 23, 24, 25, that section of the dungeon. You could start really wherever um, it would make sense based on how you've set up the adventure. If you're going after the bandits, for example, then you'd start over there. If you're finding the tavern and that's your whole goal, you'd probably start over at four. Um, if you're going for the beekeeper, one or six, you know, something like that, or I guess six, that would be there. So just, you know, that's, that's something to keep in mind. Once you kind of scan it, parse it, it's not too difficult. The writing is good. It's not always immediately clear what's going on. There are some times when you're like, that doesn't make sense based on what you've just described. But very rarely, most of the time, you can make you can make sense of what's actually being described here. And again, the ideas are worth that effort because they're really, really fun, really engaging. I think your players would have a great time with any one of these rooms being you know, plucked out of this and put into your own game. You could build an entire dungeon or entire cave system off of one of these ideas. But there are so many in here, they're all pushed together. And again, that's gonna turn some people off of this adventure. They're gonna say, well, it's just too chaotic. It's just like there's a bunch of stuff happening all in this dungeon doesn't all make sense to me. Well, you know, that that's true. It doesn't all make sense. As I said, it's a much more gamey, it's a much more meta in that sense, um, adventure. But there's some cool magic items in here as well. And some really funny things too. There's always a sense of whimsical, always a sense of, hey guys, let's not take ourselves too seriously here. And, and, and let's not take the dungeon too seriously. It's actually quite a big dungeon. So you have two levels with a lot of interconnected levels. You can go up and down. There's some ways of connecting. Although, you know, <laughs> there actually are pretty distinct sections. But within those distinct sections, there are a lot of different uh, things going on. There are some crypts and some, like, there's a lost bath down here and some ruins. And it's very clear that there are, you know, uh, ruins in this area too. So it would be... There's also like a, a forest clearing that's attached to one of the cave entrances. It's a little hard to see how this would fit geographically with a region. It's gotta be a place where there's some ruins or there was ruins on the surface um, because there are ruins down here. But there's also, it's obviously clearly a forest. It's also clearly kind of a wilderness. It's a little hard to, to figure out where this is, these caverns. But, but that means you could pretty much place them wherever you want or take out the bits that you want and put them wherever you want. It's very modular. 
lots of stuff going on. A little bit of art, but not too much. Living statues, moss men, and, uh, and the, the moss men are a new creature here. And that's the, that's the entire dungeon, just that uh, section there. I, I really like it. I like a lot of the ideas. I could easily see running this as a one-shot, running this, putting this into my world if I was playing a much more, you know, again, light-hearted, gamey system. It's not going to be for everyone's table. You're just, not everyone's going to find it the most enjoyable thing they've played. I think a lot of DMs are going to be frustrated by the, maybe the confusion at times. <laughs> Why is this here? Why is that there? How, does, how would this work? Why would these people not fight? You know, it very much has that, as soon as you go into the dungeon, the rules are a little bit more, more you know, flexible. The next section of the, the first scene has a bunch of uh, filters, fighters, I don't actually say that, filters, <laughs> I would say, and dusts. Basically, uh, alchemical things, alchemical reagents, alchemical productions, which are kind of interesting. Well, actually, really interesting. There's an acid bomb, the dust of creation, dust of desiccation, the dust of Khalil Azim, uh, the dusk of Mung. Dust of the Radiant Sun, Dust of Widows, Essences, Blue Essences, Red Essences. You could really um, play with this if you had an, alchem uh, an alchemist in your party or you had a, you know, a campaign built around it, an adventure. You, this would be a lot of interesting stuff here you could do. There's a second sort of very small dungeon here called Red Mound. It's just sort of this very weird, small, uh, old place that the native tribesmen around it fear. Um, they don't like you going there, but they won't go in at past a certain point. This is the whole dungeon right here, just a few rooms, just a few sections. And there's a, if you get to the very top, there's this altar with a, to, a, to an old god who can give you power, but <laughs> demands quite a lot. There's a cursed sword in here. There's a portal to a different dimension or a portal to something beyond the adventure itself. It doesn't really explain. It's up to you. In fact, it says entries at the referee's discretion. So whatever, however you go through it, wherever it goes to, that's up to you. But, you know, you could easily put this into your world for any number of these reasons. The players are trying to get the cursed sword. They're trying to stop the guy from contacting this old god. They're trying to contact the old god themselves. They're trying to get through the portal. Whatever reason, they could easily jump into these... Uh, you put this into a game. Very short, pretty cool, um, a little location. Rules for morale and men recruiting uh, that are used. Now, if you, I think these are the same rules that are used in Castles and Tillens, so um, I haven't looked at those closely, but I think they are. So if you if you, if you you know the Castles and Tillens rules for recruiting and for availability of troops and things like that, then this is basically that. Here's another adventure at the end, the Mysterious Manor, an adventure module for levels two through four. This is really interesting. One of the reasons I like this adventure a lot is because the, the creatures you're fighting are orcs, goblins, ogres, and hellhounds, and then some undead down below. Sounds pretty standard, right? Well, but each of the goblins, orcs, and ogres are given names and given sort of personalities, or not everyone, because there's 30 goblins, but they're given like, you know, the, the orcs are all described, the goblins are, the, the ogres are described, the leader is described, and they're given interesting motivations. It's not simply just, oh, orcs and goblins and, and, and ogres out in the wilderness being evil. I mean, yeah, they're mostly evil, but they're not totally evil, and they have other things going on. There's actually a bit of, like, expected maybe faction play here. They don't all have the same exact motivations. That's cool. So you have Rudlug, who is the half-orc ranger, and he's hired by this pirate guy who uses this manor as, as his escape, his like, you know, country escape, one of, one of his uh, hideaways. It's an old ruined estate from back in the day. There's a crypt courtyard, or crypt, uh, I should say, level below where there's this haunting and there are some creatures and they don't really know how to deal with them. They're scared of them, but they're kind of ordered to stay here and paid well to stay here. Um, it, and so it's interesting. And then there are the orc bowmen, they're agents of an orc god, Agak, who seeks to extend his dominion over the realms of men. Whereas the goblins and ogres are in it for the wages. I think that's interesting. It says hostile by default, but the occupants are open to a generous bribe. So, if, you know, maybe you could turn them on each other. Maybe you could try to pay them to leave. Maybe you could just pay them to ignore you as you go down into the crypts below. In fact, that's what it says. They will let you do that if you pay them. And then you get descriptions of each of them. So the orcs are Luguk, Kosh, Ratluck, and Tallfellow. Um, they are reasonably but not irrationally loyal. There's Rudluk and what he's like, where he is. In a losing battle, he will retrieve his treasures and abandon his companions to their fate. Uh, ogres. The two ogres, Balto and Bimfor, are quartered in the Dark Wars. They are slow to run, mainly because they are too stupid to. They're eager to get out and crush some heads. 
the hellhounds, uh, they obviously avoid, they, they kill and eat goblins. They're only let out of the manor if attacked, but then if they are, then they're unleashed. So again, there's things that you can do here. Maybe you could let the, the two hellhounds loose and they'd cause tons of trouble, scare off the goblins, burn a whole bunch of them because they obviously want to kill them and eat them. In fact, you can find a goblinoid scorched uh, you know, and dead in one of the cages of the hellhounds. So, okay, well, they're clearly not all on the same page easily. <laughs> These are dangerous pets that they're keeping. Lots of stuff that you can do here to interact and mess with them. This is a really good way of doing goblins and orcs and ogres. Instead of just saying, yeah, there's a tribe of orcs and a tribe of ogres and a tribe of goblins. No, no, no. These are people, right, in the world, and they have their own motivations. They're wicked, so, you know, it's not doing the whole, oh, no, they're actually just misunderstood. No, no, it's these guys are bad, but they're complicatedly bad. They're not simply bad. And you can then use that complicated nature of their relationships to one another to play them against each other, perhaps, if you wanted to. But there's also secret ways into the... Um, into the uh, tunnels below. Clearly, that's where you're kind of intended to go. That's The adventure would make a lot of sense if that's where you're going, but it could be just clear out the place, or maybe you, you know, there's uh, legends of treasure down here or something like that. There is an overall kind of puzzle about this ghost Felinor, and I think that's really cool. Like, you can go up to find more about him. You can find out what's going on. Sort of red herring that he can't be dealt with, but actually he can be <laughs> if you look at it from the, the pirate's perspective. And there's a lot of cool treasure here. Here's the map of the place. It's pretty simple. This is the first two levels, the, the ground level, the top level, and then there's a map later of the crypt level. Once again, this, well, I shouldn't say once again. This one makes a lot more cohesive sense than the caves. The caves are really random. This one, it all, it all kind of comes together pretty well. It, it's a ruined place that was haunted, and so that's all there. And then there are these pirate elements of the guy who owns it, uh, Seder. And then you have the people that he's interacted with, and then you have his current, like, you know, henchmen here, the, the orcs, the goblins, and the uh, ogres. And so everything there kind of makes sense within that context. So this is much more, I would say, palatable to those of us as DMs who want a, you know, a cohesive, non-kind of funhouse dungeon. Whereas the caves are more on the funhouse dungeon side of things. Cool level below. Nice and looped, lots of different options, lots of different ways of getting in here. That's one of the things I love about this. Every level of the dungeon, you can pretty much just, like going back to the uh, caves here, you can get into this place a lot of different ways. There are windows that you can get in, there are ledges on the second floor, there are, no, there's not a lot of windows on the first floor because it's a keep, but there are different ways of approaching the keep. You could try to climb up on top and climb in down from the, top, the, the side, you could distract the goblins, you could come in uh, through the cave behind the waterfall, behind the, behind the, uh, keep itself. Just lots of different cool ways of interacting with this place and of getting in. There's there's different sets of stairs and yeah, all that. So highly approve of the way that this place is designed. I really like that. It's it's tough. I think it could be a bit tricky, especially it's level two through four. If you're a level two party coming in here, it's gonna be pretty dangerous. If you're level four, probably handle it, especially if you have a lot of henchmen. You're probably there's 30 goblins, you're probably not just gonna attack straight up. Um, regardless of how you approach this place. And then there is the uh, pirate and his pirate crew here. Now, they're not set to be here, but if you wanted to... No, if you guys, if you come in here and you ruin this place, he's probably going to be after you right, if he finds out who it is. So it's nice to have his stats here. And maybe if the party's really high level, then maybe he is here. Or maybe that's something, another element of chaos that could be added in. Maybe he's just arrived in the goblins and... There's some, you know, distrust going on, and there's another further faction to do, the pirates, uh, the mates, and the, the captain, too. So, there's, you know, you, there's a lot you could do with this. It's presented sort of as an optional thing at the end. It's not part of the adventure, but I like that it's here. At the very end, there are maps uh, of an additional location, but nothing further is given for it. Unless, you know, this is his, um, you might say this is his, uh, his city, Estate or something like that. It might, you could you could connect it to the adventure that way, but it isn't clearly laid out in anything like that. It's just three levels of the of this manor, and then this map of night patrols with sewers, uh, Francesco's Plaza, uh, Barnsitions. I don't know. I can't even read the word. Uh, yeah, I can't read that word. <laughs> Yard rows, the exit, Crook's Corner, night patrols, and where they are. 
an interesting little map. I'm not sure exactly where this would be. Maybe this uh, this probably plays in with the adventure. Like there's a, you know, there, there might be a um, uh, a scroll that shows where they're going to hit next or something in town or you know who knows what it might be. That could certainly be a thing. And then you get the legal appendix with the uh, last few pages. So this is just volume one. Quite recommended. I mean, I think it's really good. There's a lot of great adventures in the Beware the Beekeeper adventure, but it is a little funhousey. The other tables that you get in this book are awesome, and that second adventure I think is quite good. I like it a lot. And once again, this is the it, it sets the tone well for the entire zine set, as far as I can tell. They're all pretty much like this, in that there are going to be some things you're going to like more, some things you're going to like less. They're all going to be useful. They're all going to have fun, interesting tables, and they're all going to be gamey in a way that is engaging. So I'll, I'll, let's go on to the second one, which is Gaunt's Nest of Spies. I really like this one too. Gaunt Nest of Spies, and these zines are all about 45, 50 pages, 48 pages uh, in, is, in this one in particular. Gaunt is a city in his world, but it's not the only thing you get here. You get the Four Wives of Sanson, which is a really dark adventure, actually. I didn't like it, I have to say. It's not It's not my favorite. It's, it's just really sad and uh, kind of creepy and... Um, Essentially, you have this guy whose wife died, and he's he's trying to, like, I don't even know. He's gone mad, sort of, and so he's, he's trying to get his wife back, and so he's, he's having these these things go out and, and turn other women kind of into his wife, but it doesn't work out, and then they kind of have to, like, yeah. It's just creepy. <laughs> it's, it's really creepy, I gotta say. Um, so I don't think I'd ever use this one, but some people might really like it. Some people might really like it. It's very short. It's only It's only that long. Just there's like three pages, four pages. Um, but you know, some people would really like that adventure. I think it has a certain darkness, a, a very severe darkness. It's kind of it's a Dreamlands adventure, so it has like Shoggoth and things like that. It's very you know, H.P. Lovecraft inspired in that way. Um, it's not my not my bag. Great piece of art here. Great piece of art here. A guide to Aurelian. Now this is his setting, and it, uh, this one and the next one detail sections of Aurelian. Uh, you have an overall breakdown of the island with some of the 12 kingdoms nearby and things like that. Um, Backland is sort of the center, I think, of this world. It's kind of his big city. And you can see Gaunt, which is detailed in this book, is uh, also on the map here. Now, I'm not so interested in the setting, I have to say. It seems cool. It seems fine. I don't really take, usually, I usually don't take settings in other games and add them in, but there's lots of ideas that I like to take and put into my own worlds, right? So, uh, so yeah, that's that's something you could easily do here. If you're interested in just playing the setting as is, you get a lot of information here, and there's a lot of cool stuff, right? Again, it's very gamey in that you can engage it. It's, it's engaging and it's it's player facing, right? It's everything here, not everything, but most of the stuff here is interested in, in providing interesting situations for the players to interact with. It's not simply lore for lore's sake most of the time. And that's really good. I think a lot of times the problem with settings that I find published settings is it's lore for lore's sake. And it's like, oh yeah, here's just a bunch of stuff that the players are never going to know or interact with. And it just makes you, the DM, yeah, stuff, more stuff you have to learn. And maybe in the, it's in the vague back of your mind, if you can keep it there, and it'll inform the way you play the world. And that can be useful. But I prefer, you know, gamey lore. Stuff that en engages with the world. That you can bring in and actually show your players and use. And that then they can hold on to and interact with. Eldritch experiments, substance characteristics, miscibility tables. And then does energy drain suck? This is a, a, a variant on energy drain if you don't like level drain, basically, for old school games. I, I don't like level drain. I never have used that. I think it's, it's a terrible, um, it's a terrible <laughs> mechanic. I understand, I guess, in one sense why it's there, I think. It really does make the players fear undead. That's certainly true, man. You, you look at a, a vampire in an old game and it's draining your levels, or, or white, I'm done. I remember in 3rd edition, uh, we played and uh, they still drained levels in 3rd edition. They stopped after that. They went to hit points in Constitution and mainstream D&D. But in 3rd edition D&D, they still drained experience points. And I remember my uh, our party encountered a white. And we were like level, I don't know, 4 or 5, and it was just one white. And we just left. We're like, nope, nope, I'm not interested in, nope. Uh, uh. Even if we kill it, and we, we would kill it, I'm not going to fight that thing. I was just like, nope. So I, I get that. So level drain really does, you know, put put fear into your players. But I think ultimately it's not worth it. And you can do that just as well by draining constitution. 
per, like uh, permanently or or maybe maybe not permanently if you could if you wanted to but at least like long term drain that tends to make players also pretty dang afraid of undead and that's the sort of variant rule now what this book primarily gives you is gaunt the nest of spies which is a town uh, sort of a uh, you know a seedy town a uh, wretched hive of scum and villainy to quote Obi-Wan Kenobi you get a background of the town uh, and then like the prominent people there and the locations that you can run into in the town and again it's really really gamey and it, by that I don't mean necessarily that it's too meta there's a little bit of that there's a little bit of humor going on here at times but it's really really engaging for the players there's a lot of stuff to interact with it's expected that there are going to be interesting things to encounter throughout this town you don't just get a random description of a random place with nothing else very interesting there. That just doesn't exist. Now what that means, of course, is that this place does feel very crowded. It's not that big of a town. In fact, it's pretty small, all things considered. You might say that this is more of an abstraction because these are like tenements, right? Some of these are. But still, it's a pretty small town. However, you could ignore a lot of the stuff that you find to be too overwhelming. If there's a lot in here, you'd be like, oh, that's not in here. I'm not, I'm not going to introduce the players to that. I'm not going to introduce the players to that. So what instead you get is a, just a ton of options. And this isn't the full town, of course, because the Undercity is what it's really about. <laughs> the Undercity is where it's really at. The top surface is just kind of there. But if you go a little further, you get Smuggler's Walk, which is what has been built over 400 years. Network of cellars, escape tunnels, oubliettes. Uh, and the foundations of major buildings. Some no longer stand. Of course, you got a great mimic there. And, and the description of the place. Now, you don't get the... Yeah, here's the, here's the uh, map of the Undercity. It's just a big, a big dungeon. And again, it's kind of confusing. It's, it's very clearly you know, hand-drawn. Hand you got to kind of follow it and try to map it out in your head and, and, and trace where things are. But it's cool. It's confusing, but cool. It's not all easily connected. It is connected the whole thing, but you, you kind of have to, you can't easily go from one section to the other. Sometimes you have to go back to the surface. Sometimes you have to come back down. You're not probably going to run this as a dungeon crawl, right? Well, probably what you're going to do is, I mean, you could, but probably you're going to be running in the town. You have to go down here. You have to interact with people back and forth. You go up and down. It's just, it's part of the city. And I think players could, you, again, you could do it as just a, uh, I mean, you could just do it as a, what do you say? a dungeon crawl. But I don't know if it would actually exactly make sense in that way. A lot of cool stuff down here too. And once again, you get this sense of hmm, fun house a little bit. There's a lot of stuff down here. A lot of very weird stuff down here. And it's not always going to make perfect sense uh, apart from the idea that this is a game and we're going to put all this stuff in here because it's cool. So that's why I think a lot of this stuff in the more funhousey sections, you can take and, and, you know, take it from this game and put it into your game if you think it's cool. You could run it as written. It's going to feel a little crowded to some tables, and some GMs just aren't going to like that. Again, it used to bother me more than it does, but I would say I'm still not totally converted to the funhouse dungeon. Not yet. Uh, there's the Swine Lord, which is another adventure. This is basically a hex and a lot of stuff in the hex, the Valley of the Witching Way. And there's a lot of cool stuff here. Once again, a lot of stuff in here. But this one makes a little bit more sense to me. Uh, just, again, because of the context. You've given it... It's not just a funhouse dungeon. It's not just a, a, a spy city where there's just tons of stuff happening. This is a valley. It's overgrown. There's some uh, runes. There's some bad stuff going on here. Uh, standing stones. It makes more sense. And it's in a full hex, 20 kilometers across. And so... It's a, it's a bigger space. It's still fairly crowded in a, in a sense, right? If you're doing a hex crawl, there's a lot of stuff going on in this particular hex. Maybe you could spread it out over a couple hexes if you wanted. But still, if you, if you didn't think it was too crowded, you could just put it as one hex in your game and you'd be all set. What's going on here? There's orcs and they're not terribly good. <laughs> they're bad orcs, but they're also bad in a complicated way. They're evil clerics of the orc god. Or that's the that's the... One of the guys here, Wormheart. And uh, Leg Langnar, Langnar, the Swine Lord. I think that's a Legnar, the Swine Lord. So, they're not just Orc Tribe bad. 
they're evil, but they're doing interesting things and they have names and they have motivations. And perhaps, and because of that, they're NPCs rather than simply just monsters to kill. I always, I always prefer NPCs to monsters you can just kill. Um, so to, this is interesting. There's a bit of advice here, right? This is one scenario where just killing the orcs may not cut it. Not only are Langnar's orcs numerous and fortified, they will readily tell any band who comes knocking they are here legally. They acquired the land in a lawful, if unethical, way by hiring one of the recognized attorneys from the city of Bakland to first put a lien on Gunald's farm, then foreclose on him when he didn't pay it. So it's interesting. These are like orcs who are interacting with the laws of the world and saying, hey, look, we took over legally. The player's going to care about that very much? Probably not. But, you know, sometimes they might. An interesting, really good piece of art there at the end, the portal opening up into the, the uh, place. Then you have the legal appendix with the table of contents. It's funny that the table of contents is on the last page. <laughs> I, I don't know exactly why that is, but anyway, that's it. So Gaunt, Nest of Spies, if you're interested in like a smuggler city, a couple adventures on the side with some interesting tables as well, highly recommend this one too. Gaunt, you could spend a lot of time there. It'd be a fun place to throw into your world as a, you know, a seedy den. If you have a, a, a campaign that you want to run, that's more of a city or maybe like, you know, return to a seedy city and deal with spies and thieves and assassins and, you know, gangs and the underworld. Easily Gaunt would be a ton of inspiration for you. At least, I mean, if, you, if you didn't run it straight up. All right, issue three is Blood, Death, and Tourism. Fantastic title, Blood, Death, and Tourism. Uh, this one is... It starts off with one of my favorite bits of world building in these books, which is the people of the Great Wheel. It's really weird, but I love it. There's this giant wheel that is rolling, and it's just rolling, and it's rolling, and it won't stop. It's not impeded by geography, nor wall, nor human effort. It goes through City Wall and Shepherd's College, Necropolis, and Tillfield with equal ease. Great is the destruction it leaves as it continues its journey, and futile efforts uh, attempts to divert, control, or destroy it. From its path of devastation has sprung a curious band of followers, sycophants and hangers-on, who follow the Great Wheel wherever it goes and add to the destruction it brings. The people of the Great Wheel, as they are called, are ever on the move, seem seemingly a part of the dust clouds which precede it. This would be so interesting to throw into your world, right? You just take the people of the Great Wheel and the horde that follows it as this weird, fantastic, very clearly non-our world thing. Like, if you put this into your world, it would be weird. The players would be like, that's kind of funny, I guess. What the heck is going on with this? And then if they ever interacted with it, it certainly would probably cease to be funny because like, there's that destruction that it brings, the, the death, the, the, the horde that follows it and, and, and you know, uses the chaos that goes before it to take advantage of it. They're the people who run in front of it. That's part of their like thing. They run alongside it and run in front of it. Uh, the aspects of the Great Wheel, the disciples of the Great Wheel, the outriders, of the, the penitents, the children, the magi. Um, there's Mulkandor, the extravagant, who's an illusionist. Uh, he has Dream Spice. Barok, the Gnomic. Zanar of the Seven Splendors. Huwash Yesk. Merchants of the Great Wheel. Even further, but ever on the Great Wheel's track, follow another curious group of wagons and beasts of burden. These well-fed fellows, all thieves, held in low esteem by their own, but well-protected by 2d6 armed ruffians each, are tradesmen of ill repute. They pick through the crushed remains and gore left by the Great Wheel's passing, extracting and selling the valuables. Flattened gold, bent jewelry, soiled purple, and cracked gemstones are their goods. And while their trade is unsavory, there are always buyers. However, when the Great Wheel stops and rolls backwards, which occasionally does happen, they are on the riches are first to go under, and they go unlamented. The current merchants and their special wares are Barjani al Barjani. Sour face, sour disposition, bad leg, whispering goat statuette. Commandus, hacking cough, masks, extreme tenacity. Graven stones from Pycon Empire's last necropolis. The testimony of a fortune seeker thrown under the Great Wheel. And Yellowstone, 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 <laughs> Yellowstone. Hoping to cut and run, looking for a group to take to safety. The crushed bones of a prophet, five kidnapped mummies. Knowledge about a buried dowry of a queen. Great stuff, legends of the Great Wheel. So that's just awesome, right? <laughs> a little bit of world building. Put it into your game. Fantastic. I love it. Terror on Trident Fish Isle, which is an adventure here. You get uh, sort of a, a few different ways to run this. It's a really interesting island. There are these people who are kind of like nobles and they're bored. They don't like each other. They, they, they go after each other. They have gemstone teeth and they have like, you know, uh, gemstone claws mounted on metal finger sheaths. They're really rich and decadent. And... There are different ways that you might come to the island. You might be a castaway on the island. You might be in one or the other because there's kind of two competing lords uh, in their service. Or maybe you're a quarry, like, you know, the, what's that? the most dangerous game, right? So you, you're you brought here to be hunted. So you, you're let loose on the island and the two lords trying to 
come and kill you. Because the idea is initially they're kind of trying to kill each other and they want you to be the, you know, the, the, the mechanism by which they succeed. But there's that variant, as it says there, that maybe they're actually trying to kill you. And so they're trying to compete to kill you first. And so you're trying to survive on the island. That'd be kind of a fun one shot or short adventure. You're brought to Trident Fish Isle and you have to try to survive as these two, these two uh, lords try to get you. You have a description of the island, the palace, uh, and the sea cave, which is the certain locations on the island here. Interesting adventure. Pretty cool. I like it a lot. I think it would be uh, a fun one. Monsters of Wizardry. Uh, it's just justly celebrated as one of the best CRPGs of all time. Wizardry 7, Crusaders of the Dark, Savant, comes with an improbable beastry of exotic and dangerous monsters. The article adapts some of those memorable creatures to the Osric rules. I never played that game. I don't know what these creatures are like, but you got a, a descriptions of extra monsters here. Floating jellyfish, a meta droid, <laughs> uh, Miniximinix, Minixilminx, Minxilminx. Is that how you say that? Minxilminx? I think. Took me a while, but I think I got there. A foot, shadow guardian, a spectral raven. And then there's Aurelian East, so a further detailing of the eastern half of the island of Aurelian. So you get Bachlin, Gaunt, and a lot of the other locations. It's a very busy map. I don't think I would have done the mountains and forests in that dark black, or it, with that prominence, just because it kind of does make it hard to read. At least my eye doesn't read this map very easily. Not to say, if you look at an individual part, you can make out what's going on there, but you just have to really pay attention and look at what you're looking at. It's easy to get lost. But it's a great region. A bit of a hex crawl you could do here, just a, a region if you wanted to add it into your world or take inspiration from it. Descriptions of some of the major locations as well as more detail on individual places like a partially sacked Barrow Mound or uh, where's another good one? Uh, a Granite Bastion, 1504. And the people who are there. There's a vampire tree in 1506 with golden apples. The Lord of the Mountains, a strange garden and enchanted castle nestled in the heart of the mountains, described in a later issue. Right, So you're not always going to necessarily get everything in this book. Gaunt, for example, which is on this map, is not detailed here. It's detailed in the book on Gaunt. So there are going to be issues that detail these things later. I have all of the ones that have been released so far. Um, so I'll, at some point, maybe I'll go through the rest of them. But just to give you guys a sense of what you're looking at here, again, really cool stuff. If, you, if you're interested in a, in a setting rather than just, or just taking inspiration from a setting, which is, again, very gamey. I say that over and over, and I don't mean it in any sort of negative way. What I mean is that there's a lot of stuff for the players to engage with. There isn't a lot of useless space. There's not a lot of random encounters that don't do anything or would be boring or wouldn't be fun. This is much more, the idea is, hey, we're gonna be sitting down at the table and we're gonna be playing for three or four hours. We want it to be fun. Who cares if it makes perfect sense? Who cares if the focus is on realism? Let's just make it have fun. Now, some people have fun from the realism, from the really, really, uh, you know, solid world where things are all connected and everything makes sense. This one has a bit more randomness to it, but that makes a lot more sense for an old school game. Uh, and then some of the, uh, the prestigious plunder for the rest of it and the table of contents. So these are issues one, two, and three of Echoes of Fomalot. I think it's how you say it, Fomalot. I, I highly recommend them all. Gaunt, uh, Nest of Spies, Blood, Death, and Tourism, and then of course, Beware the Beekeeper. Not that you're gonna use everything in these zines, not that they're all my favorite at every part, they're clearly not, but that the, the approach to these games is one that I heartily agree with, which is fun and interesting things. Things the players can interact with, things the players can engage with things that they'll remember, moments that they will have fun with rather than anything long and boring. You're not gonna have long and boring things here. Nothing's gonna be like, okay, now we have another similar room, another similar room. That's not how these places are. In that sense, it's very much like Zintillin where everything is fun pretty much. The random encounter tables were fun. The room descriptions are fun. Zintillin made more sense to me because it's sort of like a random hodgepodge castle that's by design. It's haunted and there are necromancers and liches and vampires there. And so there's a lot of gamey, kind of ridiculous stuff in it. Pigeons from hell, a, a bar manned by skeletons and, you know, patroned by skeletons in the basement and lots of random stuff like that. So it's gamey. And in that sense, I guess it's, it's very similar to these. But for some reason that one, 
the, the beekeeper one stood out to me because it's a random cave in the middle of nowhere. It's not like a, a house full of ne necromancers, which makes a little more sense for the randomness. This is kind of like, yeah, you're a, a bunch of dudes out in the middle of nowhere. And that's okay. Again, it's totally fine. It's not my favorite of the adventures, but it is really good in terms of the ideas there. So anyway, I hope this has been interesting, guys. I recommend them. I'll put links below to where you can get them. And I'll see you in another video.